Welcome everyone to our 11th meeting of our 2021 virtual family, Fabry Family Community Meeting Series. Thank you all for being here. And thank you especially to uh, Dr. Rob Hopkin for providing a presentation on uh, treatment and uh, reactions. I think you called it reactions or antibioreactions, I think, in the end. And um, so thank you for being here for explaining some how that some of that works um, to us. And thank you for Dawn, my um, trusty co-host and, and question moderator. So the way this usually works is we'll do these short introductions and then I will provide some announcements. And then um, Dawn will, I'll introduce Dawn. Dawn will formally introduce Dr. Hopkin and away he'll go. So we'll be a few more minutes um, in, in before we actually get to Dr. Hopkin, but it won't be long. So. Dawn, if you've been to these before, she um, moderates the questions and helps me out with the conference and, and uh, she can hear better and, and she's quicker than I am so she can follow the chat better. So anyway, so Dawn, as most of you know, is from Emory University. She a, has a master's degree and she's a certified genetic counselor. Officially, Dawn is a, a assistant professor, a clinical researcher, a program leader of the Lysosomal Storage Disease Center and director of the Genetics Clinical Trial Center in the Department of Human Genetics, Genetics at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Dawn has uh, focused on Fabry disease for many, many, many years, ever since I've been in this business and uh, has a wealth of knowledge and experience that supports our community and, and many things. Um, Dawn does so many things. She uh, is also the co-founder of Think Genetic um, and Dawn writes children's books. And she's a, uh, if you've been on our website, you've seen that area where we post children's books. Dawn's responsible for several of those books. And she has been a, a contributor or author to many uh, Fabry disease research publication. So welcome and thank you, Dawn. Um, so the man, the myth, the Rob Hopkin mystery. Um, you know, when you look at something as complex as Fabry disease, uh, it's really important to have people who think about Fabry disease as much as you do. And I would say that uh, Rob Hopkin is absolutely responsible for a lot of the ways that I'm able to ponder things and look at things and kind of turn Fabry disease upside down and really say, well, why is this and how could it happen that way? Um, so I think that um, having Rob up there as an associate professor up in uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital has really made a big difference for all of us in the Fabry community, not just me and my uh, extra thinking about Fabry disease. And so I'm excited to hear what he has to say today about the world of anti-immune um, system and how uh, it is affected in Fabry disease when we think about enzyme replacement therapy. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob and turn off my loud wishing noises. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So this talk is in part inspired by Angela Walter, who organized a meeting on this topic a while back, and I was asked to look at it. So I plagiarized from the slides that I prepared for that talk and edited things a little bit um, to come up with, with what I'm gonna talk about or with the slides I'm gonna to use today. Uh, this is a very important topic and one that we need to think about. It's kind of complex, so feel free to ask questions and I don't expect anybody to really understand all of it because quite frankly, I don't. And I don't think that most people uh, will be completely comfortable with everything, but that's, but here we go. Okay, so this is a <clears throat> immunology Overview slide. We Very... can't see your slides yet, I don't think. Uh oh, I forget to. I did. I forgot to do um, here. Sorry about that. I always forget something. You know, if we were on a radio show, 
then you know we'd always forget something too so this is just kind of like <laughs> press the button now can you see or what what do you see i guess excellent i see a very entertaining pirate of immunology okay oh, sorry a, a, a world war one guy of immunology Hard yeah to I, he's yes so this is immunology extremely simplified the yellow figures that look mean are things that do not belong in your body but somehow get in this slide was made for and pirated for um talks on infection but in this case we are not talking about an infection we're just talking about a protein so think of those yellow things as the proteins that we are putting into your body as treatment for your Fabry disease. The guy in green with the scars is called a dendrite, a dendritic cell. And that cell's job is to go through your body looking for things that look out of place and capture them and then it, he takes those things to the B cell, who is the pilot. If the B cell looks at the protein that is being presented and says, ooh, I don't know what that is, then the B cell turns on uh, the immune system and starts making antibodies that will attach to the protein, so the yellow guys. And then as you can see, takes them and drops them throughout your body so that wherever the unknown protein is, the antibodies stick to it and that sends signals to your body to clear those out. There are a number of ways that the body does that. We're not gonna go into detail on that. Um, and then the TH cells are ones that go in and, and uh, sort of engulf the tagged proteins um, and digest them and get rid of them. And all of that causes um, lots of chemicals to be released in your body that are meant to fight infections and they make you have fevers or chills or aches or pains or nausea or headaches or other feelings that we don't like. Okay, let's see if I can, whoops. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Now, your body is, the, the immune system's design is to look for things that are invading your body. You're looking for poisons, bacteria, viruses, funguses, etc., that are trying to sneak into your body and take over. But it doesn't always work exactly the way we want it to. So in this cartoon, the spiky guy is saying, hey, guys, this is talking to all of the rest of the immune system. Hey, let's do something. We're, we're always just really focused and serious. Let's do something crazy and react to some random thing. And when that happens, that's how you get allergies. So allergies activate your immune system. And in the case, in this case, instead of being a reaction to pollen or mold or peanut butter or something that we think of as being potentially an allergen, it's alpha galactosidase A, which is supposed to be in your body in the first place. But if you have Fabry disease, there isn't as much of it as there should be. And in some cases, there's none of it at all. So your body sees that and says, wow, I've never seen that before. The, ends, the immune cells react and they start to want to take things out. 
So in the case of enzyme infusions for fibroid disease, we put quite a lot of this protein that your body should make but doesn't into your body. And most men with classical Fabry disease, something like 80 to 90% will make antibodies to that protein when it gets put in your body. And not all of those people will have reactions, but most of them will. The reactions can come in many forms. They can cause itching, fevers, chills, rashes, swelling, nausea. We get really worried if you get swelling in your throat because you can't breathe well, or if your blood pressure drops rapidly because then your heart can't pump blood around where it's supposed to go and that can cause some serious problems. There are other serious complications. So most people will have the milder end of that list of symptoms, but some people will have really dangerous reactions to the enzyme infusions. Women are a little bit different. Most women with classical febrile disease don't make antibodies in substantial amounts. Many don't make antibodies at all. And with the ones who do, not all of them, but most of them will have low antibody types. So they get some reactions to infusions, but many just get the discomfort of being hooked up to an IV and having fluid running in rather than a reaction to the drugs. And fortunately for non-classical febre disease, because by definition with non-classical febre disease, um, people are making some of the enzyme themselves. Most men and women don't make antibodies in that situation, but they may still have some infusion reactions. So there's been not enough work done, but some uh, fairly recent um, and significant work on risk factors for infusion reactions. So these probably shouldn't be a big surprise, but when um, Van Der Veen et al wrote this up, this was the first time it had been listed. And they looked at <clears throat> ways of predicting who with febre disease would have significant drug reactions when they got their infusions. So not surprisingly, people with nonsense or frame shift mutations. So if your mutation ends with an X or an asterisk, or if it causes a frame shift so that the protein is no longer being read appropriately, um, that essentially guarantees that you will have no enzyme activity. And that is called CRIM negative. And that is highly correlated with making enzyme or antibodies to the enzyme and with having a higher risk uh, for, en for infusion reactions and, and including serious or severe infusion reactions. Um, the amount of enzyme that you get in your initial dose of an enzyme and the rate that that infusion is run in also predicts to some extent what your individual risk will be for developing antibodies and having infusion reactions, which is one of the reasons that some people will start off on very long infusions. Um, and, but usually, even if you've had infusion reactions, if you get your 
infusions regularly and you follow the same plan for the infusions, um, the risk for reaction goes down over time and the severity of the reactions often decreases with time as well, but that is not true for all people. Now, a couple of other things that they found that predicted um, higher risk for infusion reactions were if you have a family history or a personal history of reactions to medications, whether they are to Fabry disease or to other medicines, um, that correlates with an increased risk. And so we want, we pay attention to these things and we know then that people who have nonsense mutations or frame shift mutations or other crim negative mutations are at high risk. People who are in their first 10 to 15 doses of enzyme are at high risk. People who have other um, drug sensitivities are at higher risk. And we should keep an eye on those people. People who have late onset Fabry disease, have no family history or personal history of drug reactions and are at lower risk and women are at lower risk than men. Um, now, there are some things that we have a harder time predicting, and I talked about some of, touched on some of these already. Missense mutations, which are in frame, but changing one of the letters in the gene, um, some of those will have a predisposition to infusion reactions. Some of them will make no en active enzyme. So you can have high titers, but, and most of them have not been tested to see what their, what the individual mutation is. But as a group, missense mutations have a lower risk for severe reactions than nonsense or frame shift mutations. Females, Again, not a lot of large studies looking at in how well people tolerate the infusions, but the in information that we have um, indicate that women have lower risk for infusion reactions, lower risk for making antibodies and milder reactions when they do have them. In most cases, there are a couple of exceptions to that. Um, we don't know if enzyme activity measurements help us to predict infusion reactions. So if before giving you enzyme, somebody does an, an enzyme activity measure, we, that it's not unknown whether how predictive that is of reactions. And we know that females who have skewed X inactivation can have just as high of risk and just as severe of reactions as men with nonsense mutations or frame shift mutations. Other things that we don't know, does it matter how old you are when you get an infusion? Some people have suggested that children may be at higher risk. Other people have made the suggestion that older people are at higher risk. The bottom line is nobody's actually done a study to find out. Um, so we need to monitor both young patients and old patients for signs of reactions. Uh, do breaks in treatment impact your risk? So if you have been tolerating infusions and you take a couple of months off, say to go on a European vacation, um, when you come back, are you at higher risk? And we have a little bit of information on that from when the drug shortage happened 
and a lot of people were forced to take a break from treatment. And one of the things that we did find was when we restarted, we had increased risk for infusion reactions. And so I, we think that that's a risk factor, but it hasn't been really well studied. And then intrafamilial variability. Why is it that two people from the same family with the same mutation who are the same sex have different amounts of reaction uh, when they get infusions? And the bottom line is we don't know the answer to that, but we will need to think about it. Okay, now I'm gonna go through some very wordy slides, but these, you don't have to read them. This is descriptions of patients. So case one is an 11 year old who came in to my clinic and he was having severe pain several times per week in which he would curl up on his bed or on the floor and just stay there for sometimes hours complaining about how much it hurt. Now, he was, he had classical Fabry disease and we knew that he needed treatment. Treatment had just become available, but he was an 11 year old and terrified of needles. And the idea of having a needle stabbed in his arm every two weeks, he thought was worse than the pain, even though he rated the pain nine out of 10 on a scale. At age 14, he developed heart manifestations, which is by far the youngest patient that I have seen with active heart disease that was solely attributable to Febre disease. Then he got kidney disease when he was 16 and he finally agreed to start treatment. We started treatment. He had two diseases. One of them was an autoimmune disease that, that was causing some of his kidney disease. Um, and then he had febrile disease. He had a mutation that doesn't make any enzyme so not surprisingly, he was a setup for infusion reactions. And he had a lot of them when he was getting started on his treatment. He put up with that because the kidney disease and the heart disease scared him for about two years. And then he... He had high antibody titers and he just got tired of the infusion reactions. He had not been reporting infusion reactions, but he called us up and said, I'm done with this. I'm not gonna deal with Febre disease anymore. I quit. And so he stopped having those and he then started having pain crises, so he came back. And when he would come back onto treatment, he would get more reactions and they would be more intense than they had been the previous round of treatment. And he was one of the first patients that really showed me that, wow, continuously following the protocol helped. And the importance of telling your doctor what you're feeling as you're getting the treatment. Are you feeling better? Are you feeling worse? If you're having pain during the infusions, let your doctor know. They may not be able to change it, but they certainly can't do anything to change it if they don't know about it. Now, this patient's uncle also has severe infusion reactions and has required pre-treatment with multiple medications. And now he has to get a 
a pretreatment infusion to bind the antibodies in his system before each infusion that he gets. But doing that, we have been able to keep him on treatment and the patient that we started off with an 11 year old is now in his twenties. And he has for the last four years been very compliant on treatment and is having fewer infusion reactions. Again, demonstrating that talking about your reactions and working with your doctors to control them can have value. Okay, this is a counterpoint to that one. About the same time, I had another 11-year-old who came in for a neuropathic pain that he also rated about nine out of 10 on bad days. He, on the other hand, agreed to a trial of treatment while he was still an 11-year-old started treatment, the first four or five infusions went smoothly. Then he started having reactions, but he continued treatment, I think in part because his mom made him. Um, and then as he got into late adolescence, he became less compliant, but he did um, stick with the treatments and his antibodies declined and he did not have the same level. And you will, if you look at the mutation listed on this slide and remember what was on the other slide, there's not a big difference in where the mutation is. And it's the same kind of mutation. Both of these young men had uh, nonsense mutations. Now, why did one tolerize fairly quickly and effectively, and the other one had more severe reactions, some of that might be their individual makeup. How prone was each individual to um, immune response? But I think some of it was that the second one really stuck with it and we were able to adjust the rates of his infusions, adjust the medicines that we gave him, the ramp up on his infusions, et cetera, until we got something that worked for him. And then with time, his body's immune response became less and less robust because his body kind of got used to uh, the enzyme being in his system. Okay, cases three and four. So we have two brothers, they're in their mid fifties. When I met them, they had been receiving ERT for years and both of them had advanced febrile disease with heart disease and kidney disease. They both had the same mutation that's not really very far from the mutation that the other guys had. And it's the same kind of a, well, it's a little bit different. This one's a frame shift mutation. Um, the older of these two brothers had antibodies that formed, but he didn't report a lot of reactions. He usually tolerates the infusions fairly well. His younger brother reacts about half the time when he comes in for an infusion. But he also has a history of seasonal allergies, eczema, and asthma that his older brother didn't have. Now, he's recently been diagnosed with IgE antibodies. He has not had uh, anaphylactic response, fortunately, but he continues to have to be very sensitive to small changes in 
his health status and will very predictably have infusion reactions. And one of the things that we noticed with him was that what he did the day before the infusion really made a difference. If he went like, we, he came in several times, said he didn't know why he reacted that day. And my, the nurse that I work with would ask him, well, what did you do? How was your day yesterday? Are you feeling okay? And she noted three reactions in a row that one of the things that he had done was be out in his yard pruning his pine trees, which it turned out he is allergic to. And so he would have hay fever events the day before. And then when he came in, it was pretty much guaranteed he would have a, an infusion reaction. If he had any cold-like symptoms, he would have an infusion reaction. His immune system is just really twitchy. So since then, we have started asking other people who have intermittent but common infusion reactions, and we found a similar pattern. So if you know that there is something that you are allergic to, if you can avoid it the day before your treatments, it will help you have smoother sailing. If you have infusion reactions, if you have a fever or a cold, tell the people who give you your infusions about that so that they can adjust what the way they manage the infusion or sometimes even defer the infusion for a day or two if needed to avoid the reactions. It is really more than just an inconvenience to have recurrent infusion reactions that causes increased sensitivity of your immune system and can lead to more to escalation of your um, body's reactions to the enzyme, which can make it hard for you to be able to stay on treatment. And that's really important. Okay, now this one is a female, 70 years old with late onset febrile disease. And on her very first infusion, she had a reaction and it was accompanied by a rash. She had terrible itching. Now that first infusion, the reaction stopped a couple of hours after the infusion. But after that, when she came back for her infusions, she would have the same kind of a reaction every time, and it would last a little bit longer. So that by the time we were six months into it, she was having four or five days of reactions with each infusion, which means half the time she was having symptoms of infusion reaction. Now, to top that off, she's also got no antibodies that we can find to Fabrazyme. So one of the things that this taught me was not all of this is antibody mediated. So then we have to figure out, well, what do we do now? Because the management that we use, the medications that we use to stop symptoms of infusion reactions, which are usually antihistamines, Benadryl and Zyrtec are both commonly used, but other antihistamines can work too. Tylenol, sometimes steroids, and there are a few other medications that are commonly used. 
These medicines are given to stabilize your immune system when the antibodies trigger activation. So, so it makes it harder for the antibodies to trigger the activation. Well, we don't even know if that's an effective strategy if the reaction isn't mediated by antibodies. So we tried a lot of things with this particular patient and she was not able to tolerate the infusions. She stayed on them, but she was one that as soon as we had an oral medication that was not an infusion, we stopped the infusions and switched her over after, well, we documented that it was an amenable mutation and then we switched her over as soon as we could. And her reactions went away, the itching went away, the rashes went away. Now the thing is with the chaperone, her body was making the enzyme, but I don't think that her reactions were because of that, because as we worked her up, she told us, a few things that she had not thought about early on. One was she said, wow, when I think back on it, every medicine I have ever gotten through an IV, I've had a reaction to. So in her case, our working hypothesis was that she had a mast cell activation disorder that was triggered by Enzyme by IV infusions. I didn't, we did, we, we had her infused with some other medicines. She had similar reactions. I wanted to sneak in an infusion that was just saline, but I felt like that would be unethical. So we never did get that experiment. But bottom line here is, some infusion reactions are not necessarily a reaction to the drug that's being infused. Some people have, infusion, have reactions to the process of infusion. Other, we've had some people who have reactions or side effects to the medicines that, we, that were prescribed as pre-meds. And we need to think about those things as possible options as well. Okay, case five. So this is what I learned from that case. Not all reactions are due to antibodies. These reactions that are atypical, that are not clearly antibody mediated are not very well understood, but we do know that some of them can be mast cell activation. That is particularly well described in patients with Hunter syndrome, which is another lysosomal storage disease. And some people with Hunter syndrome will have an, an infusion reaction and then it will recur even if they stop having um, the medicine, stop their, they, they get weekly infusions. Um, but we had one young man who had a fairly serious reaction and then we treated that. He got his next infusion, had another serious reaction. We treated it, tried a third time. And then we said, okay, we're just gonna take a break. And on the day he was due for his next infusion, without getting an infusion, he had a reaction. And the week after that, and the week after that, and when it got to be three months in and he was still infusing or still having infusion reactions every day that he was due for an infusion, we started wondering what was going on. And so we consulted three different immunologists and two of them said, he's just still got some enzyme in his system. But the enzyme that we use for Hunter syndrome doesn't even last all of a week. 
So we were pretty sure his enzyme level was zero and we measured it and it was zero. The third immunologist said, the symptoms look like mast cell activation. And so we looked up the medicines or the immunologist informed us of the medicines that stabilize um, mast cells and stop them from releasing histamine. And we gave that to him and his weekly reactions stopped and we started him back on the enzyme and he did not react again. And his um, antibody titers had been low throughout the whole process. So that was a clear example of a non antibody mediated infusion reaction that we were able to find a treatment for. Some more recent studies have shown um, atypical and often a little bit after the, in, the infusion reactions, we still don't really have a great way of characterizing those. So keep those things in mind. Again, talk to your doctors about the symptoms that you have around your infusions. Case six, we had a six-year-old male. Now, most of the patients I've talked to on this have had nonsense mutations or frame shift mutations. These are the people most likely to have severe reactions. And this little boy is in a family with one of those mutations. And he, at age six, has just started complaining of pain on a somewhat frequent basis. His family history is also replete with severe early onset renal disease in male relatives, females being symptomatic early in life and lots of infusion reactions. So the decision to, that he needs treatment, I think is pretty straightforward. He needs treatment. He's symptomatic. He's got a severe mutation. <clears throat> and we know that it's going to get worse. And in his family, febrile disease is pretty aggressive. So what do we anticipate him doing when we start to give infusions? My thought is he's probably going to have reactions. In fact, I'd almost guarantee that he's going to have reactions. So next thing, are there things we can do to decrease the risk for infusion reactions? Should we attempt to prevent infusion reactions by proactively intervening, or should we deal with reactions when they happen? So I wish I could say, everybody raise your hand and show me, but I can't. So you're just gonna have to deal with what I think, but you can have your own private thoughts on this. So I thought, wow, it would be awesome if we could prevent these. So what are the things we could do? So one thing we could do is treat symptoms only when reactions occur. We do that by giving added antihistamine, so Benadryl and Tylenol are often used. Steroids. Sometimes we can give steroids before you get the infusion. And I know people who are started on infusions with fairly high doses of steroids being given the day before and the day of the first infusion. But that is only moderately effective. Premedications do decrease the risk of reactions, but only a little bit. So another option is primary prevention. Now the 
primary prevention, you use some much more powerful medications. Methotrexate and rituximab are medicines that were invented as chemotherapeutic agents and as powerful immunosuppressants that are used for things like treatment of lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. And rituximab is commonly used in organ transplant. Methotrexate is used to treat cancers and to shut down the immune system. So you gotta be careful with these medicines, but they have been used. In fact, we use them in infants all the time for treating initiation of treatment of Pompe disease, because almost 100% of infantile Pompe disease develops significant antibody titers. And when they do, those antibodies block the enzyme infusions from being delivered to the muscle and the kids get sicker. And we don't like it when children have life-threatening progressive illness and their body shuts down our treatment. So we're willing to take some risk. And what we found is that most of the time, if we start treatment with a combination of methotrexate and rituximab in patients with infantile Pompe disease, who we know will develop infusion reactions and very high titers, we can prevent that. And then they get a lot more benefit out of the medicine that they get. And you don't have to do that continuously for as long as you stay on the medicine. For the infantile Pompe patients, we do that for three to four infusions, and then we stop. And then they just get their infusions. And most of the time, they do not develop antibodies at all. So now the question is, what about Fabry disease? Because this is an infant and the six-year-old who does need treatment is not in danger of dying in childhood from his Fabry disease. So what do we do? The answer is we talk to the family all of the team of people on the care team involved with this child, including the parents, get a vote, and we see what the decision is. So you can think about what you would do. I have been through this multiple times, and my thought is, if I have my preference, I would use the primary prevention of immunoreactivity and try to keep the child from developing antibodies in the first place so that they don't have reactions and aren't at risk for anaphylactic response. It's probably not 100% effective. It's certainly not 100% safe because you're using some dangerous medications. But those of you who have chronic persistent infusion reactions know that it would be valuable to prevent that. And we really can't do that once you've got high antibody titers. Um, we can modulate it a little bit, but we really can't prevent those or make them go away. So I've covered a lot of things. Some patients we know are identifiable as high risk for infusion reactions. If those people are getting newly started on treatment, we need to talk to them about the infusion reactions as treaters. Families need to be aware of what to look for 
and have a plan for how to deal with the infusion reactions when they occur. I think new people starting on infusion therapy for the first time, especially in this high risk category, should be talked to about the possibility of primary immunosuppressive therapy to prevent sensitization. Not everybody agrees with that. Some of the experts on febrile disease will tell you that that's crazy. Um, this is, that's just my opinion. Uh, we know that dose and infusion rates matter. Some people have argued that we should start at a low dose and build up slowly to a higher dose. Um, I don't ever try to run men with classical Fabry disease at under a three hour infusion because you're just begging for problems by doing that. Some people will try to go to 90 minutes. I have never had luck with that and quit trying to do that more than 10 years ago um, because it just seems like a bad idea to me. Um, and then the other question is, are there other modifiable risk factors? If somebody has a cold, should we skip the infusion? If there are, aller if it's allergy season and somebody is very symptomatic, should we be more aggressive with pretreatment um, and, and allergy treatment actually? Um, if somebody has asthma, we definitely should make sure that the asthma is well controlled and do other things that decrease baseline inflammation. So should we consider immunomodulation? What about other options? Modified enzyme that's less immunogenic, the oral chaperone therapy, the oral substrate inhibition therapy, and gene therapy. Can those help us in treating people who maybe already are sensitized to the infusion? And the answer right now is we don't know the answer to that last idea, um, but those are things that we do need to think about. And if somebody does make switch to an oral medicine or to a different enzyme preparation or gets gene therapy, we need to track what their body's immune system does in reaction to that and see if there are things we can learn that can be helpful, not only for the people getting those therapies, but also for modulation of reactions for people who may only have the option of ERT. And I will stop there. All right, we had... Um... One couple of questions, Dr. Rob, were about um, about pre meds or going too fast or the volume of the um, saline in the infusion. Do those have an impact? So all of those things do have an impact. Um, uh, and. Now, the volume of saline causes more concentrated protein to be going into your bloodstream. That can be a trigger for a reaction. On the other hand, um, if you run it in slowly, that could, it might not be any bigger of a trigger. And so if you, if you need to restrict fluid, you can do that, but you need to adjust that by changing the rate that your fluids flow and sort of the milligrams per minute um, concept uh, might, might be a way to, to think about that. Um, Pre-meds have side effects of their own. So a lot of my patients 
No, they are less likely to have an infusion reaction if they take Benadryl, but they may choose not to and to risk some discomfort, especially if they have something they need to do that day because a lot of people, if they take Benadryl, are sleepy for the rest of the day. Zyrtec is less sleep-inducing, but not for everybody. For example, if my wife takes a Zyrtec, she will have about 36 hours in which she is too tired to function. It's just a given. If you are one of those, you need to speak up about it and say, hey, is there another drug that I could use? And there are things besides antihistamines that can be used uh, to kind of block the immune response. So there are, you know, talk to your doctors about medicines that might work. So we have a question here. We're only talking Fabrazyme at this point, correct? I'm curious about ERT still in research, for example, Protalix, and then if your reactions are reported. Um, so we know that some reactions are reported with that drug. We know that people who had high antibody titers on Fabrazyme who switch to the Protalix drug, that the it's cross-reactive, the, the antibodies are cross-reactive. But the preliminary data that has been presented, they haven't given a final analysis on, on all of this, but the preliminary data indicates that for treatment naive patients and for people who had mild infusion reactions, or no infusion reactions, that the risk for new infusion reactions appears to be less. We don't know how much less. It won't be zero infusion reactions, but we hope that it's significantly less. The FDA is currently analyzing that data and they won't share it with me yet. Um, follow up question Is it known why the enzyme is seen as foreign in the first place? So, the enzyme does not belong in your bloodstream except in very minute amounts. And in order to get it into all the cells in your body, we mix it with your blood in very robust amounts. And your body then looks at it and says, Wait a minute, that stuff's not supposed to be here. And it's not, and especially if your body doesn't make it, then it's never seen it before, not even in trivial amounts, let alone knows that it's supposed to be there. So it triggers because proteins are little blobs of stuff and it's the, the, the reaction isn't to the whole protein, it's to se certain segments of the proteins. Um, those parts that trigger the immune system though, once your body gets sensitized to that, every time something goes through and, and the antibodies bind to it, that sends a signal out to make more antibodies and your antibody titer goes up. So once it gets recognized as foreign, if you get pulsed, which is the way we do enzyme therapy, it tends to sustain the antibody titers to some extent. So this is a question about ERT. What are the insurance approval requirements for ERT or is it mostly straightforward? So most, so there are some insurance companies that don't cover infusion therapies. My advice is don't ever get in that kind of insurance. Um, some of them require that you have home infusions. Some of them require that you have center-based infusions, but most will cover infusion therapies. Um, 
Some will not treat any genetic diseases. Again, stay away from those, especially if you know there's Fabry disease in your family. Um, there's getting to be less and less of that because they are not allowed to do some of the things they used. It used to be that insurance companies could winnow it down to if you are healthy, we will insure you. And if you have any risk factors, we will not. Um, that has changed. And actually both political parties have decided that they should keep it that way. So I think that we're gonna be okay on having um, preserved access to care uh, but the different companies have different criteria. Some insurers want to wait until you have evidence of kidney or heart disease. I think that's crazy, but I'm just one person. Um, even some of the European countries with nationalized healthcare have that as a policy as well. So. No, there's still some debate. Um, the data that we have, however, indicates that the sooner you start treatment, the more protection you get, and the longer that protection will keep you healthy. Um, so I think we should be starting the negotiations with the insurance companies early and working with them a lot of the insurance companies actually do want to treat diseases like Fabry disease, but they have some pretty rigorous requirements for the level of evidence that we have to have that the treatment is effective and benefits you. And that is on people like me and on companies like Protalix and Genzyme and Amicus and all of the other ones to uh, gather that data and make it widely available and write the papers in a way that demonstrates the effectiveness of the drug. And that is something that quite frankly, we haven't done as well as we should. And so we, I am, not, I don't see the, I do get very frustrated with the insurance companies. So I'm not totally pro, but I also don't see them as the enemy. They are people we should work with and that we need to build um, strong working relationships with so that we can have good negotiations when there are disagreements. Um, here's another one. What are the types of doctors that would need to be on a care team in supporting decisions about reactions to ERT? So whoever your primary manager of your Fabry disease is number one, and that can be a primary care doctor, a nephrologist, a cardiologist, a neurologist, or a geneticist. My preference is that it be a geneticist, but that's because I am one. <laughs> so I have a stake in that. Um, the other groups that we find, especially if somebody's having a hard time tolerating their infusions, allergist immunologist doctors can be invaluable. Our patient with the IgE antibodies, who I said has to get an infusion before he can get his Fabrizyme infusion, uh, we would never have been able to work out his protocol and keep him protected the way he has been without the help of the immunologist. So if you're really having a hard time with infusion reactions, ask for an immunologist. Preferably one who has an interest in um, drug allergies. <clears throat> So here's a, a longer question. My seven-year-old has reactions and is currently taking pre-meds starting three days prior to infusion. He also gets pre-meds through IV prior to the infusion. One of these is a steroid. 
I'm eager to get him off the steroid and wondering if there's any idea how long, months, years, etc. reactions will last. That's really hard to predict. Um, some of that depends on how prone he is to having um, his immune system overactivate. If he has allergies, that would predict a longer time if he has other food sensitivities or drug sensitivities that might also lean you toward a longer time. Um, some people will have reactions for years. Uh, most people will not, but that, that's somebody where you might want to work with a, an allergist immunologist and try to figure out, um, you know, how do we tolerate more effectively? So here's an interesting question. So what happens if you're off Fabrizyme for years? Will you still have antibodies? Your levels go down, but there are cells in your immune system called memory cells, and they just hang out in stasis, not doing anything, while your body seemingly forgets that you were ever sensitized to things. And their job is if the same infection comes around again, to remember how you fought it the first time. And so you will be at higher risk forever once you get sensitized because you'll have memory cells that remember that it, your body doesn't like ERT. Now that doesn't mean you can't go back on. And if you go back on and you build up slowly, we've had some good luck with taking people who were exquisitely sensitive, took a couple of years off, and then their fibroid disease was progressing. So they wanted to start and we started them off at quarter dose and then went to half dose and then three quarters dose and long infusion times and then got to full infusion and then started shortening the infusions and have been able to get them on a pretty standard infusion. But there is some risk when you go back on infusion. So if you, especially if you've had a severe infusion reaction uh, that was potentially life-threatening, you want, if, you, if you're going to reinitiate therapy, you wanna do that in a controlled environment with people monitoring you. I think that's our last submitted question. Does anybody else have a question that they want to just ask Dr. Rob? Sounds like we're done. I think we're done. Thank you so much. That was great. I love your slides as always. And I think the cases really kind of hammer home what you think about and, you know, how you ponder infusion reactions before and after the fact. So I appreciate it. Um, Jerry, do you want to do some announcements now, or do you want me to do the code now? Oh, let's unmute you. Sorry, I didn't realize. I was still muted. So thank you, Dr. Rob, for um, the great presentation, and Dawn for helping to moderate questions. We'd like to do one more thing. I have some announcements. Uh, you can see my screen, correct, Dawn? Um, no, it's dark right now. Sorry? Nope, not right now. Go ahead and share your screen. You can't see it? Nope, can't see it. It's black. black. I think maybe Rob is still sharing his screen. Oh, let me stop sharing. Yeah, there it is. There, there we go. How about now? Can you see it? Um, yep, we can see it. Great. Okay. So before I uh, go over these few slides, let me get back to the beginning here. Um, Ron, would you like to 
we're going to do the prize or at least prepare for the prize drawing. So Dawn, what's our, um, our question? Um, so our, let's see, what should our thing be? How about antibody? This is for the drawing for anybody who's a primary participant in this meeting. If you'll put antibody, and I don't care how you spell it, <laughs> into the chat box, then that'll put you in the drawing for a fabulous prize. Wouldn't let me advance, so now I've accidentally stopped sharing. One moment. Okay, can see it now. Yep. All right. So while you're putting your answer in the chat box, and this portion is for the primary participants only the people with fiber disease, family members, and caregivers. And so uh, Brittany can uh, figure out who the winner is while I go through these slides. So every time we have a meeting, we like to just um, pay a little bit of attention to our to the next highlights of the industry programs. Can everyone uh, mute except for me? Background noise again. Okay, thank you. So we'd like to highlight the industry programs. And on this slide, you can see what each industry company has um, told me is that they would like to share on the slide. So you can see in the case of Sanofi Genzyme where they have a couple of websites that they would like you to be aware of if you're not already. The same with uh, Amicus that uh, they have a website they'd like to share. Casey also has their new, uh, well, fairly new, it's been around a while now, Rethink Fabry um, website and information. The three companies, Avrobio, Sangamo, and 40MT and Freeline are all in clinical trials now. So if you want ac information about access to those clinical trials, this is one place that you can go to get them. And then Adorcia has a, is the clinical trial is closed for their um, substrate reduction therapy, but they're gathering the data in preparation to go to the FDA for a potential approval. So this slide it will be in the recording. You can go back to it and refer to it um, once the recording's posted. And also I'll show you how to get to the industry information on our website in a different format, of course. So if you don't know already, if you go on our website at www.fabrydisease.org, look in the top menu bar, go to company and clinic information, select Arma info, and it'll pull up this screen below. And you'll see grids for each of the industry company. If you select the read more button at the bottom of each one of those grids, again, each company has listed all the resources that are, or many of the resources that are available to you. It has a completely different set of what's on the slide I just showed you. And you'll see if you go in there and, and select read more and see what the company resources are that you can get or ways to contact the company, et cetera. And there's also, if you went down to the support organization tab and go down to that set of boxes, you'll see um, three, three boxes for the NFDF and then other programs like the financial resource um, programs. And in our box, the middle box, you select, you can also find the recordings for all of the virtual meeting presentations. So there's two places you can go for those on the registration website and in this area. Let me advance slides. And you can get back to this information in the recording and, and pause it and see it, um, study it or, or take information off it as you like. We still have February count symptoms calendars. So if you don't have one and we don't go one out to you um, after the meetings, uh, remind us and we'll send you one. And here's the schedule in the same place that you registered for this meeting. Once we're done here, we'll inactivate the current um, registration link and we'll activate the next one, which is Dr. Dr. Nadia Ali talking about stress and anxiety and depression and things like that with fiber disease. So thank you all very much. I will stop sharing my slides. And Brittany, do you have a winner for us yet? 
she's got it. The winner is Emiliano. Say it again, Don. Emiliano has won a fabulous prize. Don and Juliana. All right, we got it. So awesome. thank you all for being here. We appreciate your uh, support and your attendance. And we will thank you, Dr. Rob and Don again and Brittany. And we'll see you on the next uh, presentation. Have Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.